Hi, welcome to Some of Your Parts Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Betsy Greenleaf, premier pelvic health expert and women's wellness warrior. Join me as we discuss women's wellness topics and discuss tips and tricks with top elite health experts and where you'll discover that you're greater than the sum of your parts. And don't forget to like and follow this podcast and the YouTube videos so that I can keep bringing you great information. Also, follow me on Instagram at Dr. Betsy Greenleaf. Okay, ladies, I gotta let you in on a little secret. 50s is the new 20s. That's what I'm talking about. Definitely look at all the amazing women over the age of 50 that are rocking it. Say JLo, Kelly Ripa, and many, many more. So today we're going to be talking with wellness coach Deborah Atkinson, who's got a 35 plus year fitness experience and has helped over 150 million women flip their second half with the vitality and energy they want. She's the author of You Still Got It Girl, the After 50 Fitness Formula for Women, Navigating Fitness After 50, and Hot Not Bothered. Deborah hosts the Flipping 50 TV and the Flipping 50 podcast show. She is a frequent speaker and expert recognized by AARP, Washington Post, Prevention Magazine, and USA Today. She also has a recent TEDx talk titled, Why Everything Women in Menopause Learned About Exercise May Be a Lie. So we're going to find out more about this today with Deborah Atkinson. So I'd like to welcome with me today, Deborah Atkinson. Thank you, Deborah, for being with us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. So you've been in the fitness world for a good amount of time. (laughs) This is year 36. Wow. How did you get involved in fitness? Um, Gosh, such a funny story. So I grew up and I think we were not too long ago at a party where we had to be what we were going to be when we were little. I was going to be Jane Goodall. And then I realized that my idea of camping was the Marriott and that was not (laughs) going to pan out very well for me. So (laughs) I actually grew up drawing as well. So I went to school, went to college for two years. I was a graphic designer, but back then everybody who was in graphic design smoked and drank and stayed up all night to do their projects. And that also did not fit. So I had one foot in physical education one semester to see, do I want to go there? And one foot left in graphic design. And by the end of the semester, I had some excellent instructors. And what I realized is I want to make people feel like that. You know, it wasn't so much that I wanted to help people get skinny or lose weight, but I wanted to give them the power to be better moms, better spouses and bosses and employees and whatever their roles were, because that's what I got from exercise myself. And that's how it started. And you brought up that, that there's things that we thought about exercise that may be a lie. What kind of What kind of misinformation is there about exercise? Well, particularly if you're a female, just 39% of all exercise and sports medicine research features women. So yeah, no matter who you are, you're, you're a teenage athlete or you're a prenatal, you know, client who's trying to get pregnant, wants to get pregnant you're a midlife woman, perimenopause, menopause, or postmenopause, any one of those phases of life really is covered at a very small fraction of all the research out there. So when you think about now textbooks, programs, personal trainers, how they were, you know, how they studied, what they studied, not, not any of their fault necessarily, right? But the things they studied and the guidelines we've all been following for so long were based on most often young athletic men. So, you know, the bottom line was I just had a forehead slap moment. Whatever made us think that what works for a young athletic male at the peak of muscle mass will work for a 55-year-old female basically at the peak of fat storage. 
Oh, yeah. That's craziness. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, it's no wonder that so many of the women I work with, as I grew up in the fitness industry, watching baby boomers age, you know, who were essentially my older brothers and sisters, you know, watching them age and hearing that nobody understands me, that this young trainer doesn't understand how it feels for me to do this, or that my joints don't want to do that anymore, or that I'm tired, you know, or that I don't need chair aerobics, I'm not broken. I mean, there was no middle ground, you know, for an older woman who wanted to be athletic and still look good. So I, I knew there was a niche and we needed to figure out how do we make her do this and feel good at the same time. So it's not exhausting. We're not frustrating her and she's not getting any results, even though she is exhausted. So I thought I got it as I was, you know, in my thirties and forties. And then I left everything safe and secure to start an online business and really reach a bigger target. I really wanted to reach more women, more trainers and help them grow their businesses, talking to them. And then I panicked, right? The day after I handed in that resignation letter, I was like, what did I just do? I'm going to have a college student in eight months. I'm going to be paying tuition. So I tethered myself to my keyboard for a long time, about a year to get this business rolling. And I became somebody who exercised 20 minutes a day instead of hours a day the prior three decades. But after about a year, I actually looked better. I had a better body composition. I had more energy. And, you know, had, had I gone through hormonal changes at any other time in my life or in a phase of my life, I would have exercised more and harder, just like any other respectable woman would have, right? In order to combat the sleep and the, you know, changes and shifts in belly. And I realized, okay, how did this happen? And I had to dig into how did I end up with better results with less exercise? Because this is against everything that I ever learned. So I dug into it and realized that this was the truth, you know, that women were hardly represented in research. And, you know, if you happen to be a runner, here's the truth about that. It's even worse. So right now, 50%, almost 46, I think, percent of women um, runners cross the finish line of marathons. So oh. of, of all marathon finishers, 46% of finishers are female. Let me say that well. Okay. Yeah. Now the research on running only 3% is on women. Wow. I mean, that's how skewed it is. So the excuses were too variable. You know, we have these different hormones, these different metabolisms and body composition and even socialization. So researchers don't want to deal with this because it's too hard, but those are also the very reasons we need to really look deeper at how is it making us feel? And the message is here's, you know, the thinking we've got right now is that we should feel bad. We should do something really hard that makes us feel bad. And in Someday we're going to wake up and that's going to feel great. <laughs> is that crazy or what? But that is truly what we do. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I was thinking about, uh, I, my exercise right now is pretty poor. So I'm hoping to learn some things from you, but thinking back when I was in my twenties and I was working with a trainer, I had the traditional big muscle head trainer who was having me do heavy, heavy weights and reps. And no joke, I've given myself a hernia two times doing that. Wow. So, um, <laughs> you know, and, and you're right. And you're like, you know, it's got it. You got to be sore the next day. That's how, you know, you're like, you know, doing the right thing. And, you know, oh. I've been, I've been there, you know, I'm yeah. sure I'm not the only one. So exactly. You know, and I think we tend to, you know, we do this insanity piece of that, um, if a little bit is not working, mm -hmm. then I'm going to do more. Right. Yeah. 
instead, generally, we should have some indication that even a little bit is starting to go in the right direction and then start doing more of that, right? So it's kind of like if you're trying to train a puppy, you know, to do the right thing, you, you give it rewards for doing the right thing, right? So we don't want to, we don't want to feel miserable. We don't want to really be punishing ourselves. And, you know, soreness is a definitely evidence of muscle breakdown, muscle tearing, but the key is that's telling you we've got to recover. So that's the other piece of, you know, figuring out how much, how often, what time is the best time to exercise for specifically hormone balance, which is really what I'm catering to, because how can we help ourselves naturally feel like we're in hormone balance? Whether you're choosing to do hormone replacement or not, you can do everything possible in your lifestyle habits as well. And exercise is one of them. But the thing we also abandon is recovery. We've we've forgotten rest and recovery. And what does that look like? So one of the tips I like to give is, you know, some exercise requires recovery and some exercise is recovery. It's our job to figure out which is which. And you've brought up the fact that exercise is can actually be affecting our hormones. So oh, absolutely. How does, yeah, how does that happen? And it goes both ways. So exercise either is influencing hormones or is influenced by hormones. And it's, it's all happening simultaneously. But during midlife, so we start to have the declining sex hormones. And we all know that that's coming. The estrogen drops, the progesterone and the testosterone drop. But that ends up having an effect or impact on your energy level. So your energy and desire to exercise might change and the rewards that you get from that exercise also potentially change. So to see muscle definition, we need testosterone. So if your levels have dropped, that's one indication that, you know, you might be saying, hey, I'm doing all the work, you know, I'm and I'm having that protein, you know, but I can't see any definition. And it's just not the same as it used to be. I used to be able to see that when I worked that hard. And part of that is you've got to potentially exercise differently. So you do need to do the strength training, but you need to do it in a way that we truly reach fatigue. Not necessarily does it have to hurt, right? So um, as your example, you know, whether or not you're choosing to go heavy and fewer repetitions or you go lighter and you do more repetitions, both are right depending on your body type and or what conditions you might have, you know, or old joint injuries that you might have that need a little bit more TLC, but fatigue, reaching to fatigue is key. And then we've got to sleep. So sleep comes in like a, you know, a placebo effect for your exercise in a sense, if you're not sleeping and you're exercising and you're eating right, you're still not going to see all those results. We've really got to dial in that sleep because testosterone and then a, a partner to that growth hormone which also helps muscle definition. They're released the most at night when we're sleeping. So we got to be getting into that deep sleep. The good news about that is, you know, do the right exercise, not too much, not too little, but that Goldilocks, that will help you sleep, right? So it's listening to what's happening. What kind of reaction is my body having to the exercise I'm doing? Is it telling me I'm doing the right thing or too much or too little? You know, I've always been confused about, because I have I guess I've gotten mixed messages with exercise about, oh, you need to be doing cardio or, oh, you need to be doing strength training or, no, you don't need to do cardio. No, you don't need to do. St-. So what, what, is, yes. what is the truth? What should we be doing? Well, yes. I'll just say yes. Okay. So so the truth is you've got bones and you've got muscles and we need range of motion. So you still do need to do some proportion of your workout needs to be cardiovascular, but more important than probably doing all of that long and slow exercise, you know, like we used to go 
or long, long jogs, or we used to spend hours on the cardio equipment or in classes, you know, the aerobic queens out there. And and I am raising my hand. I was right there with the best of them. But we don't need that as much as we need some interval training, some getting breathless on a regular basis. And that too is not about doing more of it. We tend to have this if a little is good, more must be better mentality, and we get carried away. And the truth is for balancing hormones and giving you energy, not stealing it, but giving it back so you feel like, I've got this today. I am on my game, and I can go you know, stir up the bacon and fry it up in a pan and all that good stuff. You want to have more energy when you're done and have exercise than when, you know, you feel like you have to recover on the couch. That's a sign you've probably done too much. So you need a little bit of cardio. Yes. But I'd say the older we get, and I mean, starting in our forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, every decade that goes higher, I would say strength training is your most important thing to be doing. My mom is 93. And if I could get her into that weight room at the retirement center, I'd be doing it. So, um, I have not had very much luck, but (laughs) (laughs) I don't give up. Right. But you know, when you're talking about walking upstairs or getting up and down out of your chair, getting from your bed to the bathroom, all of those little things that we don't think right now are ever going to be a problem for us. They at some point will be. So we want to hold on to muscle mass. And the best way to do that is strength training. You can't outrun, you can't out Zumba, you know, your muscle loss and specifically bone density, which also really needs strength training and weight training. You know, it's um, building bone density by strength training is not going to save us from falls. You know, the balance will do that, but we all need to protect ourselves in case a fall happens that our bones are in better shape and can handle it. I think it's tough because you know, you look at the statistics on Americans, unfortunately, the majority of us are pretty sedentary. Yes. So we all Still. know to oh. exercise, but it's, yes. it's just not happening. Um, that is such a great point. And I'd love to unpack that just for a little bit. Great. So I think I mentioned at the beginning, this is my 36th year in fitness. But unfortunately, when I was an undergrad student, I learned a statistic that is exactly the same right now. We are not exercising anymore. You know, that 25 to 30% at best of the population is exercising enough to affect their health and not even performance, but their health. So we have kind of passed around the same population from one fitness center and program to the next. And and then they rotate again because people get bored. But we haven't really penetrated deeper into those people who really need it. So maybe we can tackle a couple of myths here. And the biggest obstacle is time for a lot of people. I don't have time. So the challenge, right, is the question back is how much time do you think it takes? So, you know, I think if you can let down the the guard or that really high podium that you've got exercise on and remember that it all counts, that really just being someone who moves more sometimes can matter more than formal exercise. Um, the UPS delivery people. And, you know, back then, I don't know if they still do this now, but they used to, like, they would park their truck, they would grab a package, they would sprint from the truck to the door and then sprint back and then go and do it again. They were essentially doing little intervals all day long. You know, and though they would, they would say they had a sedentary job, they were in really good shape. And, and none of them said, you know, I work out. They were just active on their job. They were making the best out of the, the job they had. And I think that was required. I don't know that they were highly motivated, but they had a quota to get done or whatever it was. But that was such great evidence to me that 
I'm still obviously talking about it 35 years later, you know, and looking for little ways to be active, you know, and if you're, you're at a desk and the best you can do is stand up, you know, some of that time and not sit all of that time or drink a lot of water. So it makes you have to get up and walk down the hall to the restroom more often, then that's the best you can do. But try to, you know, do a little walking before work. If you have a dog and there you go, it's built in. Try to walk over your lunch hour. Try to walk again a little bit at in the evening. But if you can get 10 or 20 minutes each of those times, even that counts. And nobody said you have to sweat, you know, whether you do or you don't, you know, who, who knows. But the point is the movement is really what's important. So for hormone balance, even that type of exercise on a day when it might have been highly stressful for you anyway, can be enough. In fact, it can be a great fit. You know, it's funny because I do that all the time. And I think women in general, we, we just were balancing so many different things that I always say to myself, I'm going to exercise once everything is done. And the problem is nothing's ever done. Right. And because I put this definition of like, I got to set this time aside. So yes. I think that you make a really good point by bringing that up, just a little movement throughout the day adds up. It certainly does. And then there's that, you know, maybe the answer isn't, you know, when everything is done and I'll do this, but it's actually to book an appointment for yourself and put it in there while you've still got the energy early in the day. And, you know, I think a lot of us think, well, I have so much to do. I don't have time to exercise. I think that's a big default for all of us. But the true answer, if you look to the people who exercise regularly, you'll find really productive people who who do an amazing amount. And what most of them have in common is that their report is that when I exercise, I am more efficient. I get more done in less time. And it doesn't take so much wheels turning and trying to focus or refocus and concentrate again. It kind of refreshes me so that I can dig in and get more done. So if you can think of it that way, and even if you say, I don't know if that's going to work for me, you know, try it for three weeks. Just commit to that and decide after that point. And you may decide if coming back to the way I used to do it, but you may, you know, turn the corner and set a whole new habit. And I think you might've already answered it, but I always think too, it's like, oh, I got to go to the gym to exercise. Like, like, I feel like that that's where exercise is supposed to happen, but it doesn't have to be that way. No, you you know, I mean, let's think about that a hundred years ago. Was there a gym, right? I mean, it was like bales of hay in the barn, you know, who was going to get the water or whatever. So really, you know, I think everybody, every person out there, because we are all so busy, we've got that in common with anybody else in the world. Everybody should have a couple of options right at home. So it's convenient, you know, three pairs of dumbbells, a light, a moderate, you know, and a heavier set, a ball, a... You know, if you don't have a treadmill, can't do that. Something that you do enjoy, great music to turn on and dance to for 20 minutes. I used to, when I was spending so much time in front of my computer that year, sometimes when I would get up, it was in the middle of the winter, sometimes I would get up from my chair, turn on music, and I would just play a game with myself that for 20 minutes, every minute I would do a different dance move or aerobics move. And that was it. That was my 20 minute break. And sometimes it wasn't intense, but it was movement and it felt better to move than not to move. That's a good point when it's the winter time. And if you're living in a place that's cold, like I'm in New Jersey, the motivation to exercise and yes. move kind of Bye-bye, goes away. Right? <laughs> so, or God forbid, to, I got to, you know, once again, bringing that, I, this feeling like I need to go to the gym to exercise. Like who wants to go out in the, in the cold to go to the gym? Right. But that there's so many things you can do around the house. So, yes. Now, what about like, are there things that people can use for strength training around the house? Absolutely. And I would, um, I would 
not hesitate too much to say that most people probably do have a couple dumbbells around the house. Yeah, yeah. You know, they may be dusty, but you know, I bet they're there. So, you know, in starting out, you know, you can do a lot of things with body weight or, you know, go to the kitchen cupboard and get, you know, a couple cans of vegetables or beans that are going to be a little bit heavier and start with that, right? Going through the motions, if you're starting from scratch is super valuable. And when you're, you know, adding something to your lower body, get a couple of those coffee table books and hold on to them, give them a hug and do your squats or your lunges with that, or walk up and down the stairs a couple of times with them and with laundry. I mean, you're doing a little weight training when you're doing things like that too. Absolutely. Is there a time, like amount of time that you should be doing the weight training? Like how do you gauge yeah. like, how much is too much? How much is not enough? Great question. So usually the way I re respond to that is what time to have, what's realistic for you, you know, and that's the best way for me to tell you what would I do with that time if I only had 10 minutes and mostly we want to dispel the myth that three times a week is it. We yeah. learned that many of us who are oh, in our sure. late 40s, 50s or, or older, we learn three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, and still a lot of classes. If you go to a gym or you look at a schedule, it's going to be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. But really for older adults, two times a week is the sweet spot. All of the studies notoriously come back to people who exercise or do strength training specifically twice a week end up burning more calories, more energy expenditure overall than people who exercise three times or one time. And the science behind that is this, those who exercise one time, of course, they don't get enough strength and stamina and endurance to actually help them the rest of the week. Those people, though, who exercised three times actually exercised so much that they really did couch compensate afterward. They were less active in their life oh, when they wow. went to the gym that much because they kind of dumped it all out. They left it there. And those who exercised twice a week had strength and stamina, but they had energy. So then they were active all day, every day. And that's really what you're striving for. And so... I'll tell you that from a study of a, a fairly large pool of people and then challenge you to know yourself. So I'm someone who likes to exercise probably a little bit more than the next person. Some of you, somebody watching or listening is thinking, you know, you know, just enough is enough for me. <laughs> just that I'll just do that. And then no more but I'm active. Maybe you're already doing a lot of things and you may have, maybe you are the mail carrier or maybe you are the UPS delivery person and you're carrying boxes and you're doing a lot of things in your daily life. All that counts, you know, so don't discount that. Maybe what you need is then one more good strength training day and then and a long walk on a weekend and an interval training day the other day and you're done. You're covered. Yeah. How do you recommend that people do interval training if somebody doesn't know anything about it? Yes. Okay. So let's define it. Really, that's a great question. So interval training is really what we mean when we're talking about how do we boost our benefits for the hormones? How do we boost our fat burning benefits? It's getting breathless. It's doing something intensely where you are really looking forward to that break. So there's going to be an interval where you're working really hard and there's going to be an interval where you get to recover and you're, you're barely working at all. And we want both. What we all tend to do is think, oh, I don't really need that break. And so we don't really take it, but then we don't really get the high when we're interval training. We kind of just wash that out and it all becomes gray again, right? And we're trying to get away from that. We really want to think about driving your car in town using all the gas because you push the accelerator, you push the brake, you push the accelerator, you push the brake. It's inefficient. We're trying actually to exercise inefficiently so that you use more energy. So we want you to push the accelerator and go really high, get out of breath, and then come all the way back down and recover almost to resting. And you'll know that you're totally recovered when you're breathing through your nose again. 
And you know, when you're out of breath, when you really couldn't carry on a conversation, you're breathing totally out of your mouth and you probably want to bend over and put your hands on your knees for a second to say, just a second. That's a good place to be. So to do a good interval training session, my go-to when I'm busy is a 20 minute session and that's a five minute warm up, And then it's going either a minute or just 30 seconds really hard at, at any mode. So we can talk about them, but anything can be interval training and then recovering for a minute. So it's at least equal to, or it's greater than the work interval. And that's not necessarily always what you see when you go to a gym. So there are problems with that too, (laughs) but you do that interval training that hard and easy and hard and easy for 10 or 12 minutes. And then you cool down for three or four more minutes, including a stretch and you are done, totally done. That was it. And that's really all it should take. If you've worked hard enough, you suddenly feel looser and lighter and more energetic. And yes, you feel like you worked, but you're not beat up. That's an ideal in interval training session. When you put it in those time frames, it doesn't sound as overwhelming. I think that's been one of my problems about exercising is that, you know, once again, going back to like assigning this time and it, it sometimes becomes so overwhelming to be like, oh, do I have the time? But when you say it like that, it's like, oh, that's nothing. So, yes. It goes very quickly. I think the advantage for those people who maybe aren't bonded with exercise too, is that you're mentally engaged when you have to kind of watch that 30 seconds and watch your minute and watch that 30 seconds again. It goes very quickly. You know, and if you have a good, you know, music tunes on that you love, you know, it goes quickly, feels like dancing it's and it's over. You know, I don't know if this is a myth or if this is correct, but I heard that going into mindfulness, that when you mindfully exercise, you actually are doing more for your body than if you're kind of mindlessly walking on a treadmill for like hours and hours and hours. (laughs) So true. So I'll take you back. So I used to teach in kinesiology at Iowa State University. And uh, one of the courses that I taught was a little bit of lecture, a little bit of lab. We were taking our freshman, sophomore students and teaching them the physiology of fitness by teaching them as their own guinea pig. So I would pre and post test them at the end of the semester, beginning of the semester, and they would have to do a, a mile run. And I would not let them use their iPods. and And I swear, you know, if you've ever seen a 19, 20 year old pout, you know, right. They didn't know how to do it without, they're like, are you kidding me? Right. (laughs) So, um, I was, I thought I was going to get letters from parents about that, but you know, I pointed out to them that what I wanted them to do was to pay attention. I wanted them to tune into their body, not to be distracted. So we call it, you know, it's like be intrinsically motivated to actually tune in, not to tune out, not to be distracted. And, you know, it changes everything about the way exercise feels for you when you're either in it or you're away from it and distracting. And so much of our lives, we are just, we're tuned in to, you know, our phones. And when we go to the gym, if that's what we do, but there's a, there's a TV screen on it, sure. right? Or at home, we probably put the treadmill in front of a television screen. So we don't go internally very much anymore. It can be really beneficial. There are a lot of studies and I was a an exercise psychology major. So there are a lot of studies about, you know, what we believe, you know, when you blindfold people who get on strength training exercise or equipment, they will tell you what they can lift. And then if they're blindfolded, and the trainer or the researcher puts the weight on, you will find that they can lift far more than they thought they could if wow. they're blindfolded and don't see it. Yeah. That's interesting. Isn't it? Yep. 
And by about 40%, women specifically underestimate the weights that they can lift. Huh. Yeah. Well, talking about exercise psychology, how would you recommend that someone get the motivation to to exercise? Are there any kind of tricks to kind of find that motivation to just start it and do it? That is such a good word, first of all. So let's unpack that word, right? So maybe, maybe it's not motivation. Maybe it's discipline, right? Or maybe it's inspiration, but it may be commitment that we're really looking for, right? So think about the difference between when you get married, and that's a long term commitment, right? And, you know, you may not be motivated every day right, in our <laughs> relationship. I mean, because there are arguments and there are things distracting you in your life besides the relationship, but you're committed to it. And so you work through things and you get, you get done what needs to happen. The, the conversation, the, you know, all of that connectivity And likewise with exercise, when you commit, when you decide, and a lot of people haven't decided, we need to be better decision makers, potentially not necessarily motivated. But I think in answer to that, the, um, and I'm going to take a walk with you. So bear with me here, but I've got to plug in. (laughs) Um, My answer to that a lot of times is people lose motivation, I think, or have a hard time finding it, mostly because they can't connect the dots between what they're doing and the results that they want. And when we're not sure whether the time and the energy and maybe the money that we're putting in is actually going to help us get what we want none of us would be motivated, right? But if we are sure, if we understand the why behind what it is that we're going to do, more of us are committed. And then there is that for a little period of time, you've got to have discipline. You've got to have something there or accountability to keep you there. But once you turn on the, I feel good, most of us like to keep feeling good. That in itself is the motivation. So when you get a program, a a trainer, whatever it might be that you trust, that will help keep some accountability and get the discipline for the short term that then ends up motivating you in the long term because it feels good. It feels better to do it than when you don't do it. I think, you know, one of the problems is in our culture is we want instant gratification. And I know that I'm there. Like I get frustrated. Like I'll make the decision to start exercising. I do it. I do it. And then I don't see the changes that I want to see as quickly as I want to see. But then you know, as a woman, and then my husband will do stuff and he hardly does it. And you see like, changes and I'm like, that's not fair. <laughs> I've been working out for months and nothing's happening. And you work out for like a week and like you get all these changes. And that is, is in part testosterone for sure. Right. So they can, they can go into the weight room. They improve their testosterone right away. We go into the weight room. We improve our testosterone a little bit. And, and yet we've got also estrogen and progesterone and we've got all those other hormones that they don't that it takes a little bit longer. And you also want to look at, okay, if I've consistently been doing this for four weeks, is it the program I really need for me right now? So the program that you did in your 20s and your 30s is not the way to get the body that you want in your 50s and your 60s. So it may be less exercise. It may be at the at a different time of day. It may not be cardio. It may be strength instead. But there are a lot of variables to look at and tweak. How does the time of day affect your exercise? Yes. So cortisol, mostly, I mean, is the biggest impact. So cortisol, as you know, it it should ideally wake us up, 
if we could all wake up naturally, not to that nasty alarm clock, that <laughs> about 8 a.m. our cortisol level should be at our all-time high for the day and naturally waking us up. And if you are someone who says, I'm more creative, I'm more productive in the morning, you know, my brain is just firing more. So if I'm going to write a paper that's really important, I'm going to work on that in the morning then probably cortisol is working on your behalf as it should, right? And, you know, for some of you, if you're a slow starter, you know, and you don't start to feel good until noon, your cortisol potentially is off just a little bit. It's not on that norm. But for the rest of us, that normal high, you know, at 8 a.m. may have another swell between 11 and 12, but then it starts to taper off. And in the afternoon, if you have ever experienced those cravings, right? And somebody brings in a tempting treat, it it looks so much better between 2 and 4 p.m. than it did at 10 a.m., right? (laughs) That's when I lose all my (laughs) self-control is at 2 (laughs) o'clock. It gets very sexy in the afternoon, yes. But part of that is because cortisol is coming down. So it gets a bad rap as the stress hormone, but it's also the energy hormone. So it gave that to us in the morning. We didn't really need it. But now when we don't have it, that's when we're looking for the caffeine or for the sugar in the afternoon. And so it gets a little bit more tempting. But what we want to do instead is ideally high intensity exercise in the morning can kind of help you kind of bump that cortisol work with it when you already have more energy. And then in the afternoon, later, we want to calm down because when that cortisol starts coming down, we get edgy. So we've heard that term hangry. Yes. So that, you know, that is as much about maybe sleep deprivation the night before as it is about just cortisol coming down and you're edgy. You know, and so what we want is soothing kinds of movement. So if you can get outside and go for a walk, maybe not where you are and it's frigid cold in the winter, but maybe it's yoga, you know, going to a a warm yoga class, Um, but something where it's relaxing for you. So if you're watching yoga pants make you anxious, that may not be your jam either, but (laughs) you want to find something that you enjoy doing. And that's your more soothing exercise so that we can prepare you for sleep at night because cortisol should be at its all-time low at 2 a.m., meaning no energy, you're sleeping and and you're charging up again to have it higher. But it's counterintuitive, I think, because most people may say, well, if my energy is coming down in the afternoon, shouldn't I then exercise to rev it back up? But actually, you want to work with your cycle, work with it, not against it. So rev yourself up when your energy is naturally high and you'll keep yourself in that, okay, now I'm supposed to be awake. It's like setting a baby schedule. So we want to get them on days, right? And nights and nights are for relaxing and calming down. You know, it's funny because I was actually thinking about my kids and no wonder they have so many problems because I have a nine and 11 year old because all their activities are at Late. night. Yes. And then trying to get them to go to sleep is like miserable. And then they're dragging during the day. And I'm like, well, you know what? We kind of have this all backwards with kids yes. activities. So <laughs> maybe they should be doing their sports in the morning and then school. Yeah. Well, and depending on how old they are, you know, I think it is all backward in those um, like high school kids. When we try to get them out of bed to do basketball practice, they should actually be sleeping in. Right. And they can go on later at night because they're just like different creatures for a little while. (laughs) But it's true. You know, so many, so many younger people are doing sports now that I think gyms are so solidly booked that they've got kids doing things really late. Yeah. You know, I wanted to ask you, since you're an expert with hormones too, just, I don't know, can you just explain a little bit just how hormones affect exercise and exercise affects hormones? Absolutely. So back to, so if we break down, say strength training. So when your signs and symptoms, like in midlife, tell me a lot about, okay, what can we do exercise-wise to help 
calm that down or get those back in alignment. So if you were to say to me, you know, I am having um, a lot of hot flashes, I'm having night sweats, I've got that going on, and I'm not seeing any tone or definition, no matter what, I've got this crepey skin, you know, it's loose, um, what's going on, and I have no libido, right? So that's a very common list. Yes, <laughs> yeah, a long Christmas list that I get from people. But what I would suggest then is what you've said to me just in that little snapshot, if I were going to give that back, I would say, let's prioritize here. And what what we really want to be doing is looking at exercise wise, we want to be looking at strength training as your biggest priority right now. Want to get in two high quality strength training workouts. And we're going to focus on major muscle groups. We're going to work to fatigue and If you were just starting out, I would suggest we're going to do somewhere between 15 and 20 repetitions. And that's how we choose the weight that you're going to lift. So there's no exact science. You'll have to play a little bit, but you're trying to reach a point where I get to the last one I can do really well between 15 and 20 repetitions. And, you know, you're not going to drop it, not going to drop it on your nose, but you're going to actually reach that point where I'm starting to cheat. I can't really get another good one. And then, you know, you've reached an overload that will make that muscle stronger and boost your hormone levels between as you're in recovery. So you're going to focus on that. You're going to exercise major muscle groups. And we're going to choose probably six or seven different exercises that you're going to do to fatigue. So we're focusing on a lot of major muscle groups because we're when we do something like a squat, you're using major muscles of your hamstrings and your quadriceps and your glutes. So several muscles, not just a single one. One of my biggest, biggest complaints is if I catch one of the trainers who used to work for me, for instance, having somebody sit on a bench and do a bicep curl with one arm, I would go through the roof. I was like, I guarantee you this person has no time to do that. (laughs) No time to do one joint at a time, sitting down, not exercising the other muscles. Let's just not do that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So super important that it's somewhat functional, right? So, but we don't want to get so carried away that we're doing variety for variety's sake. And I think in fitness today, we see a lot of that you know, we've, we've gotten so bored, but I think that's as much fitness instructors and trainers as it is participants. There's just, there's so many toys and tools that we've got to come back to what are your goals? We want to boost your metabolism. We want to work on your bone density. Okay. Well, let's talk about the exercises that really do that. Not, you know, what's the brand new trend that came out in 2020, right? So yeah, let's talk about you. That's the important piece. So strength training really is going to help boost testosterone, boost your growth hormone, and done correctly, you do it and then you're done. You're not doing it for hours. You're doing it twice a week. That also helps cortisol because we've all forgotten that cortisol is supposed to be something that, you know, we run a race and then we're done with the race. And, you know, life seems like a race all the time. Now for most people, you know, if there's a stressor at work, it's, it goes on for months. It's not just a couple of days to a project and done. It's, it's, there's another one right after that. So learning to exercise in a way that uses stress and then lets you recover will help put back some of that balance that we've lost. And it helps our resilience to, you know, knowing that, okay, I can handle this. You know, the stressors in your life are not going to go away because you're weight training, but you may feel better able to handle it. Like it's not, you know, getting you the same way that it did. So those are big. It's also strength training and interval training or regular cardiovascular moderate level of normal, kind of not long extended, but just good, short or normal, moderate um, duration are great for blood sugar stabilization. So in that way, we're talking about insulin. And if you're you're worried about belly fat or you've got some and you cannot figure out how to get that off, 
cortisol and insulin team up together, right, to deposit that. And they are like the dynamic duo that you never want on your team, but they are on your team. <laughs> they will relocate fat cells to your belly. They will create fat cells where there were never fat cells. They'll make baby fat cells grow to big fat cells, you know, and it's pretty miraculous, really, but nobody wants that. And um, so stabilizing blood sugar is very important for, you know, lack of cravings, right? We want to eliminate those. And that way you have the energy to exercise when you have the window of time open up when you can exercise. Because that's another another problem for a lot of people that, you know, when I do have the energy, I'm hungry or I'm exhausted or, you know, I just don't have the energy to do it. And stabilization of blood sugar will stop some of that roller coaster and help smooth that out. And what you eat when you eat is just as important though, as your exercise, when you exercise and how you do it. Yeah. Cause I'm assuming that if you're having a diet that's high in sugar, then you're going to get more of those pipe, you know, peaks and drops. Yes. And then that's going to affect your, your stamina or your, even your, your motivation or inspiration to go to work out. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and I think we've got to say, you know, somebody, somebody here might be saying, well, I don't, I don't eat sugar, but we let's qualify that. So if you love that glass or two or three of wine, you know, every day that's metabolizing as sugar and, you know, certain carbohydrates are better than others. So let's not throw carbs under the bus, but just to be sure, you know, there are some that will stabilize, they'll give you energy right away and then they'll stabilize. And there are some that give you energy right away, but then they drop you on your bottom, right? So you want to make sure you're having the right kind of carbohydrates and enjoying those because that too helps to decrease your cortisol level. It's amazing how much cortisol has an effect on just so much of our health and even like our hormones. So... Well, it is a hormone, but I think it's important that women in midlife know that they're more susceptible to the negative effects of stress simply because all of those other hormones right now are so volatile. So when when estrogen tanks and progesterone and testosterone tank, that leaves you more volatile. It's kind of like the guard is down and cortisol just can have a heyday with you. So you really... If you've ignored your own self-care and you've gotten away with it when you were younger, now's the time to kind of step it up and say, I got to take care of myself. Now you have a program called Flipping 50. What is that all? And then Flipping 50 TV, what is that all about? So Flipping 50 is really the brand name for all of the exercise programs and the coaching that I do. Flipping 50 TV is a great place for somebody who's got got a question about, you know, I'm a woman in midlife and here's what's happening. I guarantee you we've got right now 39 episodes that are live and they're free for the watching at flipping50.com. And, you know, so if, if it's libido or it's why do I self-sabotage, it was going so well, you know, that I think is episode two because it was so popular, right? And I picked the most common questions, the most frequently asked questions and try to tackle them all. So if you've lost a lot of weight and you still have that creepy skin and you don't have any tone, there's a question on that. If you are somebody who's got arthritis and you're looking for how do I exercise intensely because so many things hurt and don't feel good, but I want to look good, right? So I don't want to be limited by that, you know, and have to settle. There's a question. There's an episode on that. So they were literally questions I took from our community members who wrote in and gave me enough backstory. So I literally talked to that question. Yeah. So all 39 episodes are right there on flipping50.com. Oh, I think I'm going to have to watch number two. Yes. <laughs> like me. That's my problem. I self-sabotage all the time. You've written a number of books also. Yeah. So the first one, I, the very first one I did for this population was 
navigating fitness after 50. So it was really targeted at both men and women, just kind of a stepping into the fitness arena at this point in my life. How do I choose a program or how do I choose a trainer? What questions do I ask to protect myself? And then kind of the signature one for Flipping 50, the brand is You Still Got It, Girl. It's the after 50 fitness formula for women. So that is where I really laid out that it's the exercise, but it's also got to be how you feed the exercise, how your overall stress level is and realizing exercise is stress. So, you know, like, like a violin or a kite, you want that optimal tension in the strings, right? When you're exercising too. So exercise is a piece of the puzzle, but we pull in the whole, the hormones, the rest recovery, the nutrition, the exercise, the, um, what am I missing? The stress um, and the sleep. And all of those, we talk about those seven components and how they're integrated and they each play on each other, but also help the reader pick out which one is your top priority and make all of your decisions in the other components to get that one right. Because usually there's one domino that if that one falls, the other ones will fall correctly. Yeah, I like the one you were bringing up with the first book about how to kind of pick the right trainer, because I've seen that a number of times of my patients because, you know, they'll go to the gym and, and they may be a little bit shy about using the trainers that are, you know, the stereotypical, you know, muscle head trainers are in the gym. So then they've gone to their physical therapist. There's a lot of physical therapy places are offering personal training and they thought, well, here I am, the physical therapist should know what they're doing. And then next thing they know, they're in, they're injured because mm-hmm. like you said, because of this research, not geared towards women and maybe being stuck in that kind of old mindset of how we should be exercising that I've had a number of women have come back and they're like, I thought I was doing the right thing and now I'm injured. Oh, shoot. So, yes. And that's disheartening, but if they can get back on the horse, right? So I think if we can give some advice to everybody listening, it would be question everything about your exercise, you know, and question one, are you feeling good? Does it make you feel better or does it make you feel worse? Do you feel, you know, are you frustrated or exhausted or you're feeling more energetic? You're starting to sleep better. Even before the scale changes, you're having indications that maybe your clothes clothes are fitting better. Your energy is a little bit higher. Your mood is better. All of those things are an indication you're probably going in the right direction and trust your gut. So I think rapport with a trainer is really important. So if you feel like you can't ask challenging questions, then then maybe that's not the trainer for you. You know, we've talked a lot about exercise strength training and cardio. And what about, what's the role of, of stretching in all of this? Because I've heard so many different recommendations about, you know, any kind of stretching or I might not even be using the right terminology nowadays. But. <laughs> no, I think you could still say stretching. It's still politically appropriate. Okay. <laughs> so stretching, mobility, we call flexibility. What used to call flexibility is mobility. We look at it. You know, what you want is a great marriage of stability. So we want strength and mobility or flexibility so that we've got the ability to move through full range of motion. And that ends up giving us mobility. And so that's where we want to be. But stretching is probably also going to grow in importance as we age. And especially for those of us who sit a lot, right? So opening up specific areas like our hip flexors regularly during the day, not just, you know, one time or on the weekend when you exercise, but when you get up all the time. And if you're a female who sits a lot and you wear high heels, that's doing a job on your hips, ladies. So you need, and I'm not saying get rid of the shoes because I get cute shoes. I get that. But, um, you know, make sure that you are giving yourself some stretching time, some yoga or some Pilates to 
open those hips back up. And almost all of us need to open up the chest and the front of our shoulders, just even passively doing that right now. You know, you need it probably, and you didn't realize it. And it's like, oh my gosh, that feels so good, right? Because passively our upper backs round forward. We're tight here, not because you're pulling with anything doing push-ups, but because it's just passively rounding forward. So if you can pull that back and do that regularly, those things are really important. And then it's, you know, being able to reach up to the top shelf to put the china up or get the china down those few times a year, you know, when you do that, if you don't have a day job that's physical, making you do those things, you still want to keep that range of motion. So important to do a lot of good stretching in most days of the week used to be the recommendation and it still is the recommendation. Absolutely. I noticed for myself, I mean, I'm actually postmenopausal because I hit, had a hysterectomy when I was 41. So, and I'm 48 now. So I'm, I'm, I'm flipping 50 in a number of ways, but <laughs> um, yeah, I've noticed that being postmenopausal, especially that my, flexibility has just tanked and I'm just amazed at how tight everything gets and how much harder it is to move. And, and you bring up a good point because I spend a lot of hours sitting and I feel that a lot of times my low back. And I think what ends up happening is like you get those hip flexors get tight and your iliopsoas, which is the muscle that's running, you know, in your abdomen and the back of your abdomen tight. And a lot of times we feel it in the back. And I always, I always thought it was my hamstrings that were the problem, which could be, but you know, it's doing those other exercises to kind of open things up. Yeah. Well, and so anybody who's sitting here watching can do this with you, but the piriformis is often, you know, a target culprit too. So if you're sitting, just crossing one ankle over the opposite leg, you know, in what I call the number four stretch, because that's kind of what it looks like if you're looking from elsewhere overhead, and then you're just going to sit and hinge forward from your hip, reaching toward that knee with your sternum keeping your back as long as you can to get a good hip stretch. So a lot of times when we experience that lower back pain, you want to look to the joints above it or below it. And usually it's that those are tight. Your lower back should be actually a stable joint. So it's not meant to be mobile there, but your hips are and your upper back is. So if you're not able to rotate freely in your upper back, or your hips are tight because you sit a lot, or then you're also a weakened warrior, maybe exercising hard, you need to get those hips stretched and that upper back more mobile again. And the lower back then won't be where you beg, borrow, and steal it from. Yeah, great. And and you were talking about opening up the chest. I think so many of us are either like hunched over like computers or on our tablets or phones. We don't, we don't even realize it that we're you know, shrugging our shoulders and and rotating them forwards and kind of hunching forwards. So yeah, well, in such a great, you know, segue to the other place where women hold their tension, it's the neck and the upper back. And so we don't often realize that, that, you know, by five o'clock, your shoulders are like two inches closer to your ears than they should be. And you need to ha. Huh, take a deep breath and let it out and relax a little bit more. And that's um, stretching, you know, side to side with the head and neck, just elongating it and often pulling this back. So it's now actually a technical term called tech neck, probably will be in Webster's dictionary very soon, (laughs) but pulling that chin back, you know, retracting a little bit and just drawing it back and strengthening it can be very helpful to kind of offset your day-to-day postures. Well, thank you so much. You've had so many wonderful tips. So where can people find out more about you, your programs, your books? Definitely can find me at flipping50.com and that's all spelled out. It's words, no spaces. And, you know, we're on Facebook and we've got a really active YouTube channel. So lots of helpful tips there. Um, And the YouTube channel is youtube.com forward slash flipping50tv. 
Great. Thank you so much, Deborah, for being with me today. Thank you. Today's episode was brought to you by the Pelvic Floor Store, your source for personal health. You can find us at www.pelvicfloorstore.com. For more information on today's episode and women's wellness, please go to drbetsygreenleaf.com.